Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's a great cloudy day in, uh, in the Lower Mainland. I don't know where everybody else is. Ho hopefully some of you have some sun out there, but I'm not so sure about that. All right, I think we'll get started. Um, so welcome to the session on helping clients with a work plus sexual harassment case. My name is Karima Budwani. I met some of you, but not all of you. So nice to meet you all, uh, virtually anyway. I'm a program director at the Law Foundation, and I'm delighted to facilitate the session and introduce the speakers. Uh, before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that we're gathering on the traditional territories of the Musqueam, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Squamish peoples. And I'm, of course, zooming in from the traditional territory of the Kequot First Nation in New Westminster. We have two fantastic speakers for you today, Jennifer Kaur and Juliana Daly. Jennifer Kaur is a supervising lawyer and project manager for CLASS, CLASS is Sharp Workplaces Program. She has dedicated her career to access to justice issues, human rights and gender issues. She brings a lot of experience to the session, having worked locally, nationally, and internationally on these issues. Juliana Daly is a staff lawyer at Migrant Workers Center, and she brings a broad perspective to access to justice issues from her current work at Migrant Worker Center. She also has other background from her previous experience working in immigration and refugee law from her work at CLASS, where she helped clients with housing, income security, human rights, and employment issues. So welcome to you both. And um, now I'll hand it over to you, Jennifer. Oh, thank you very much, Karima. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, please let us know if you have any problems uh, hearing us. Um, we'd, of course, like to just start with a, a land acknowledgement. Um, Juliana and I are coming to you from the traditional and unceded ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish nations. And, of course, we uh, recognize that you may be coming to us and joining from territories in other parts of BC. Uh, before we introduce ourselves, well, Karim has introduced us already. Uh, we uh, would like to learn a bit more about you. So we have a little poll for you to do, um, if we can launch the first poll. So there are just a couple questions um, for you to share a little bit more about your uh, clients and the work that you do. And we'd also like to invite you to um, uh, sorry, I, I was just checking. Uh, we'd also like to invite you to introduce yourselves in the chat. Um, so if you want to put your name and uh, your role in organization uh, and perhaps what territory you're joining us from, that'd be great. Um, for those of you who might want to introduce yourself uh, online, you're welcome to unmute and do that as well. So we'll just wait uh, a few minutes for you guys to fill in the poll. And while we're doing that, I'll just uh, review some housekeeping things. So um, this presentation deals with topics that could possibly cause distress or discomfort. So if you need to step away or leave today's presentation for any reason, it's perfectly fine. Um, there will be opportunities to ask questions and interact during the presentation, but you're under no obligation to do so. Uh, we're happy to take questions throughout the presentation if you want to put them in the chat or unmute your microphone when a question comes to you. Uh, please keep interactions respectful for all. And of course, this presentation is for informational purposes and not legal advice. So thank you. Uh, I think we're starting to see a couple of people introduce themselves in the chat, which is great. Um, and people are still answering the polls and joining. Perhaps we can end the polling now and share the results so we get a sense on how, how people, what experience people are having. 
So just to share the results with everybody. Oh, the poll does not allow multiple answers. Well, we apologize to, for that because we were hoping uh, that, that it could. So sorry, some technical issues there. I'm assuming that people picked the main issue uh, that they've been working on. So we see that people have a diverse uh, background of experience. So we appreciate uh, people responding to that. Um, thank you. And some of you have experience in the areas that we're talking about today. So that's great that you'll be able to share your experience. And if we look at the clients um, that you're helping, <laughs> that there's a broad range of people that uh, you're assisting. Um, I'd be interested to know maybe what other marginalized groups that people are assisting, if you want to add in the chat or uh, unmute yourself to comment. Juliana, do you have any questions or comments? Yeah, no, um, thanks, Jennifer, and, and thanks, everybody, for joining. It's really great to see um, all of you and you virtually, of course, um, and uh, uh, some familiar uh, names and faces. So, um, yeah, looking forward to, to chatting with you today, and um, hopefully we can all learn together. Um, and thanks for introducing yourselves. It's great to get a sense of what areas people are working in. And um, we'll talk a little bit more in the presentation later about, you know, um, we want to really build our network and um, and get a good understanding of you know who out there um, it can is working in the community on these issues and so um, it's great to see um, to see uh, all of that from you and so thank you great thanks Juliana yes I see that people are commenting that because they couldn't pick multiple groups that they just uh, picked other because they serve many groups so we appreciate that and uh, oh um, uh, assistance with agricultural workers and migrant workers. So that's great to know, Juliana. So thanks for that. I'll stop sharing the poll results now. Um, so just to review the objectives of today's uh, presentation is obviously to introduce our programs and our organizations. Um, and we hope that by the end of this presentation, everybody will be able to recognize what workplace sexual harassment is, understand the legal options for someone dealing with workplace sexual harassment, um, describe uh, the services offered through SHARP workplaces and the Respect at Work uh, legal clinics and how to access our services. And as Juliana already mentioned, hopefully talk about creating or strengthening a referral network between our organizations. So for those of you who don't know, I'm with Community Legal Assistance Society, and I'm sure most of you know, uh, CLASS is a nonprofit that's been assisting people uh, pr through providing legal assistance since 1971. And uh, I think that you've been uh, having the opportunity to hear from a number of our lawyers throughout this conference. Um, CLASS has uh, five programs now um, that provides as assistance. So there's the community law program that focuses on advice and representation for basically poverty law issues, housing, income security, workers' rights, and uh, judicial reviews of human rights and mental health rights. Um, the mental health program providing representation to people who have been detained under the Mental Health Act, as well as those who are subject to the mental health disorder provisions of the criminal code. Uh, we have the BC Human Rights Clinic that represents people before the provincial a human rights tribunal and they also have an education program and a short service clinic uh, and of course we have the community advocate support line uh, operated by allison who uh, provides support to advocates such as yourselves and i know she's been involved in the conference throughout uh, other sessions as well so our newest program is the SHARP Workplaces program, which I'm responsible for. And SHARP Workplaces stands for Sexual Harassment Advice 
response and prevention in workplaces. And it's a partnership between Class and Ending Violence Association of BC. So we have two components for the program. Uh, one is the legal advice uh, clinic, and we'll talk a bit more detail about the legal advice clinic later in this presentation. And the second component is the public education component. So class obviously is responsible for the legal advice component and Ending Violence Association leads the public education component that we partner together with. And we are, are funded by the Department of Justice Canada and have received funding until March of 2024. Juliana? Thanks, Jennifer. Um, so yeah, I um, uh, will talk a little bit about the Migrant Workers Center. Um, so for those of you um, who may not know um, us, we are a nonprofit community legal clinic um, that provides free uh, legal assistance and advocacy to migrant workers in British Columbia. Um, a migrant worker can be um, anyone with temporary immigration status. Um, so we assist workers um, who are in Canada with work permits. Um, we also assist um, undocumented workers, international students, and um, other temporary residents um, of BC uh, with issues um, relating to their uh, work and immigration status. Um, previously, uh, you may have known us as the West Coast Domestic Workers Association. Um, uh, and we are now um, uh, the Migrant Workers Center. Um, and our mission is to facilitate access to justice for migrant workers through legal information, advice, and representation, and to advance the rights of migrant workers through public legal education and law and policy reform. So I'll talk a little bit about um, our um, new uh, uh, legal clinic uh, program as well. Um, so we um, uh, have launched a new project, uh, which is called the Respect at Work Legal Clinic. Um, this is a, a specialized um, legal clinic for uh, newcomers who have uh, faced or are facing sexual harassment in the workplace um, and is also funded by uh, the Department of uh, Justice under this um, special project funding. Um, our project is a partnership with uh, ISS of BC, Immigrant Services um, uh, Society. And um, so through this program, um, we have a legal advocate and staff lawyer um, who provide legal advice, uh, summary legal advice to, um, to newcomers. And um, we are focused on, through this project, uh, providing services to all newcomers to Canada. So a client does not have to be a migrant worker um, to uh, uh, access services um, through Respect at Work. They can be any newcomer, so, so that includes permanent residents of Canada, citizens, um, as well as temporary residents um, as well. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more later in the presentation about um, how to access uh, these services. Um, but for now, I'll just mention um, as well, uh, like uh, like classes, sharp workplaces. We also have um, we have two sort of two components to our um, project. There's the summary legal advice um, component, and there's also um, an education information um, and training available to individuals and uh, service providers. So um, we wanted to start off at the uh, beginning of our um, workshop to have a bit of a discussion. Um, and I know many of you have probably um, worked on cases that dealt with the topic of sexual harassment um, in the workplace. And so we wanted to ask you um, to share your thoughts as to, you know, how would you define or describe workplace sexual harassment and whether you'd like to, um, if you'd like to give some examples of what um, might constitute workplace sexual harassment. So you can um, feel free to put answers in the chat or um, unmute uh, your mic and, um, and uh, uh, provide a, a response. So we'll just wait a few minutes um, for folks to, if you'd like to, um, participate, uh, you can you can do so and, and we'll um, discuss the responses. I know it's a difficult topic, so um, I appreciate that uh, it's a challenging thing to talk about. Um, and if we can also just continue, um, uh, we have one um, answer that is um, any sort of unwelcome and inappropriate comments or gestures that are sexual, explicit, explicit or implied. Yeah, absolutely. 
And also, if you don't want to message your answer to everyone, you can send it to us privately and we can read it out um, anonymously as well. Um, showing inappropriate pictures at work. Absolutely. Yeah, so maybe we can um, we can move to the next slide. Um, any unwanted sexual behavior in the workplace? Exactly. Yeah, I'm offering um, promotions or um, employment advantages in exchange for um, in exchange for sex or um, sexualized interactions, conduct in the workplace that makes someone feel uncomfortable or based on markers of gender and sexuality, absolutely. Comments on people's appearance or physique, absolutely. And it's a form of discrimination involving verbal behavior that offends or humiliates. Yeah, so we've got some really good examples um, that, that uh, folks are, are providing. It's a precise legal definition but harassment occurs in, in various ways. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so Jen, do you wanna move us to the next slide? Um, and as you have all alluded to um, and, uh, and put forward in your responses, um, sexual harassment is, um, uh, can take a number of different forms. And there are many, many examples of, um, of what it can look like. And it can run the range from, you know, various kinds of conduct, including um, that many of you have mentioned, such as um, staring or gestures or, you know, teasing or in offensive jokes, um, comments about someone's physical appearance um, to, you know, unwanted attention, unwanted physical touching um, and sexual assault. Um, so it covers a very broad range of conduct. And um, in terms of who it can involve, it's important to note that um, sexual harassment can, of course, come from a manager or a supervisor or someone with power or control over another's employment, but that's not necessarily the case. It can also come from um, clients or customers, um, coworkers or peers, or really um, any people um, who are connected with, with one's employment um, when we're talking about sexual harassment in the workplace specifically, or workplace sexual harassment. In terms of where it can take place, um, again, this is, uh, it can happen really anywhere. Um, it can happen at, while at work, it can happen um, on in locations or um, virtual locations uh, that are connected to work, such as um, you know at, at conferences, at social outings, um, on social media, over text, um, over Zoom, um, in a variety of different settings. So we'll talk a little bit about, and, and you've all in your examples and um, comments that you put forward have um, provided a really um, important range of different um, different examples. And uh, I think this really highlights how, um, you know, sexual harassment can take different forms. There's no one um, sort of, you know, de definite, uh, you know, definition, but we will talk about um, the, the definition that has been um, put forward by the Supreme Court of Canada um, as sort of a starting point to talk about, okay, broadly, when we talk about sexual harassment, um, what are sort of the key elements to proving um, sexual harassment in the conduct, context of human rights um, law. So in Janssen and Plady Enterprises, um, uh, it's a Supreme Court of Canada decision from 1989, uh, the Supreme Court uh, definitively affirmed that workplace sexual harassment is a human rights issue um, and constitutes uh, discrimination. Um, so in that decision, the court uh, defined um, sexual harassment as follows. And the court said that sexual harassment in the workplace may be broadly defined as unwelcome conduct of a sexual nature that detrimentally affects the work environment or leads to adverse job related consequences. So this definition has three elements. Uh, there must be behavior of a sexual nature. The behavior is unwelcome and the behavior produces negative consequences for um, the complainant. So um, it's important to note um, that this does not require intention on the part of the, um, 
uh, harasser. Uh, they don't have to intend to cause discomfort. Um, rather, it is enough that the behavior is unwelcome. Um, and later in the presentation, we'll talk about some examples. Um, we'll look at some case studies um, that explore this a little bit. So um, yeah, I'll turn it over to you, Jennifer, to walk us through some um, further examples. Thanks, Juliana. So um, workplace sexual harassment can be based um, on different characteristics. Uh, it, it can be based on sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression. Um, as, as someone in the chat has uh, pointed out already. Um, if you did attend Adrian Smith's uh, presentation earlier in this conference, I'm sure you had a more uh, robust discussion and presentation about these concepts. But just uh, briefly to highlight, sex um, is the physical traits that you may be born with or the sex that you're assigned to at birth. Um, sexual orientation or attraction is how you find yourself drawn to or not drawn to um, other people in a sexual or romantic way. Um, gender identity is really how you uh, think of yourself or psychologically experience and define yourself um, and based on how you align or don't align to the gender um, expectations of society. And uh, gender expression is uh, how you express your gender. So through uh, how you dress or your demeanor or um, your actions. And often workplace sexual harassment is caused uh, by gender normativity. And so by gender normativity, we mean that the idea that there are certain expectations uh, for certain roles of uh, women and men. So, um, sexual harassment can also be a pattern of uh, behavior, and that behavior may be uh, different. Uh, so, it doesn't necessarily have to be the same type of behavior. And uh, here we uh, list a few different types of behavior that can um, be involved in sexual harassment. Uh, people may be targeted um, for uh, being different and it may be uh, combined with other, uh, other issues such as uh, uh, comments uh, or with respect to someone's race or ableism. Um, and the behaviors in the workplace may add up to create a hostile environment. Some behaviors that are uh, might be microaggressions may not be immediately apparent that that's sexual harassment. And so it's important that we uh, take time to listen to the client um, to um, understand how it's affecting them because sometimes our own identities and privileges may make it difficult for us to recognize and understand um, what's happening and what the client is experiencing. So uh, in that regard, um, sharp workplaces and uh, migrant workers respect at work, uh, we are trying to take a trauma-informed approach to our, our work. And that means uh, recognizing that uh, people might be experiencing a very difficult and vulnerable uh, time as a result of the sexual harassment and uh, try to integrate knowledge about how people are affected by trauma in terms of how we uh, address the client in our procedures and in our services. So we're, we're trying to emphasize safety and uh, creating a relationship and connection with the client and trying to support them to make uh, the decisions that they want to make and uh, supporting them uh, with respect to uh, finding their strength and building their skills. Um, so in that regard, all the staff at uh, Sharp Workplaces and Respect at Work have, been, have received uh, trauma-informed um, training as well as the roster lawyers um, that assist uh, Sharp Workplaces with 
our program. Um, thanks, and I'll add as well that um, uh, as with our organization, we um, also have um, uh, undertaken to um, to shift our um, you know and adapt our intake processes and and our practices to um, towards a trauma informed lens and have um, uh, endeavored to. Um, to learn um, in that regard. And so, um, so yeah, so with that in mind, um, we're going to talk uh, a little bit now about, you know, what are some of the steps that can be taken if you're assisting a client um, with a sexual harassment issue? What are some steps that the client can take? Um, all, you know, within the lens of, um, you know, the client is um, at the the center um, and, you know, it's their decisions and their um, uh, perspectives and wishes that we um, try to honor. And, um, you know, that might include not doing anything about the situation um, or doing something, you know, depending on on what they want. And the goal is, is really empowerment um, and to support the client in um, being able to access whatever um, remedy or choice that they choose. So in that um, regard, um, so if, if a client is experiencing workplace sexual harassment, um, you know, there are a few sort of things that, um, that they can do to begin with. And these are not mutually exclusive options. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more um, later in the presentation about, you know, how our programs can support and how we can work with you um, to support your clients um, who may be facing these issues. So in, um, in many cases, um, one of the things that we can start with is um, to offer the, um, you know, the option of, you know, keeping notes and keeping records um, for clients that um, may need to, you know, may, may not want to take any steps at this point, but might potentially want to in the future, having notes and records um, that they can refer to can be a really um, effective way that they um, can ultimately, um, you know, uh, access justice and um, uh, and seek um, redress if they do end up deciding that they want to pursue a kind of claim. Um, and I'm sure, um, you know, uh, many of you are familiar with um, uh, some of the types of evidence that they might want to collect, but this could include, you know, text messages, um, timesheets, uh, personal, you know, um, notes or records of what took place, um, emails, um, that sort of thing. Um, now, another option that um, clients might want to consider is making an internal report. So um, workplaces um, may have an anti-bullying and harassment policy um, under which uh, a uh, someone can make a complaint, um, and that might be an option if um, they want to do something to try to resolve the situation internally within the workplace. Um, in certain circumstances, that's not going to be appropriate, um, and so by no means is this, you know, a necessary precondition to making a sort of um, to accessing a legal remedy. But we'll talk about um, some of the ways in which impacting a, an internal complaint can impact uh, legal proceedings later. Um, employers are required to have procedures for dealing with reports of harassment um, in the workplace. And if a workplace does not have such a policy um, or if a worker has reported an incident and they feel that the steps that their employer has taken are not sufficient um, or reasonable, then um, the worker can at that point um, maybe consider talking to a prevention officer with WorkSafe BC. We'll talk a little bit more about that in, um, in a moment. Um, but basically, um, the role of WorkSafe BC's prevention officers in this um, context is, you know, to, to ensure that employers, you know, have the proper resolve um, is works a safe workplace. And finally, um, the um, a client can, you know, seek legal advice about their options. Um, so next, we're going to go into what some of those um, options that they might have are. So this uh, diagram, the slide shows a number of legal options that uh, someone has, uh, may have, if they're experiencing workplace sexual harassment. Um, and they aren't uh, mutually exclusive. It may be possible to pursue more than one option at a time. Uh, so Juliana has mentioned a, a little bit uh, WorkSafe. Uh, we'll talk about that more later as well as some of the other uh, main options uh, here. I, it's important to recognize, I think, um, from a 
trauma-informed perspective that some options allow the complainant to have more control or direction of the process. So, for example, certainly the human rights uh, processes or um, potentially the courts, uh, whereas uh, in comparison to other avenues uh, such as criminal court or uh, union grievance, um, it's the prosecutor who decides with respect to the criminal proceeding and the union, uh, the grievance is really the union's uh, grievance. So it does take some um, of the control out and away from the complainant. So that's one of the issues that we do talk to clients about uh, when they're considering their options. Some of the options may, they have different remedies, but some of them have overlapping uh, remedies. So uh, it's important to recognize that you can't get uh, compensated for the same thing uh, through different avenues. So if someone's claimed for lost wages uh, through WorkSafe or to employment standards, um, you can't uh, get compensated for that same uh, period through your union grievance or from the Human Rights Tribunal, but you might have other remedies such as injury to dignity that's still available um, in the human rights process. So um, because that there, there are a number of things and factors to consider when making a decision, we do think it's important that someone uh, has access to some legal advice uh, for that and uh, um, obviously, uh, we're happy to talk to uh, your client or uh, assist you um, in that area in, in considering the options. And hopefully this presentation will help you uh, to be able to guide your client um, in the initial advice. So uh, one of the main areas, um, oh, and just before, as Juliana said, it's obviously important that to recognize that um, some clients may not wish to go ahead uh, with a, a legal um, action or remedy, and they have other options such as talking to their harasser directly or reporting um, through work, um, and they or they may be interested in leaving the workplace, and it might be something that we can help uh, negotiate uh, and ex exit package and then provide them referrals to employment supports. So uh, we'll talk first about the human rights uh, tribunals and it really is the main way that people often seek a remedy for their workplace sexual harassment. Um, and that's for a number of reasons. That's, as I said, uh, complainants maintain more control through the human rights process um, traditionally, the process is seen as easier to, to access and navigate than the courts. Um, and they do have broader remedies available. Um, and also the tribunal is, is recognized to have some expertise in this area. So sexual harassment is viewed as discrimination. Um, so under the human rights code, uh, you're protected from uh, discrimination based on a number of prohibited grounds or personal characteristics, such as sex and gender and gender expression. Um, some others are listed on the slide. And uh, as we mentioned before, the discrimination may be uh, wrapped up uh, with other uh, protected grounds. When you file a human rights complaint um, in British Columbia, you file directly with the Human Rights Tribunal. If your client is working in a federally regulated industry, then you file with the Canadian Human Rights Commission, which will accept uh, and review and accept or not accept the complaint. And if the complaint's accepted, it will move forward to the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal. So uh, in terms of the remedies available, um, the human rights system is designed to try to place the person in the position such that the discrimination hadn't occurred. 
And in that regard, they may be uh, compensated for lost wages and expenses related to the discrimination. So the lost wages could uh, include lost wages uh, from the time they may have left the job where they were dealing with discrimination to when they find another uh, comparable um, position. Um, under the BC human rights uh, legislation, clients are also able to get compensation for something called injury to dignity. So uh, it's basically compensation for uh, injuries to their feelings and their feelings of self-worth. Um, and that uh, we've seen recently in a trend to increasing awards in the BC system. Under the federal system in the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal, there are two different uh, compensation available that's in some ways comparable to injury to dignity. Uh, one is known as uh, called pain and suffering, and the other is if the discrimination has been willful or reckless. Um, the tribunals have a certain amount of more um, power uh, uh, or remedies options available to them and that includes um, ordering the person to return to work in, in the position if the person wants to be back in the position or finding another position for them in the organization. Uh, also, of course, orders that the employer stop discriminatory practices and may include orders for the employer to develop a policy if there is one developed or improve it or uh, require training um, for their staff. Um, in the human rights system, there's also protection against retaliation. So if someone files a complaint and is uh, experiencing uh, negative uh, conduct from their colleagues or their employer, um, there are remedies available through the tribunal for that as well. So another option for someone who is uh, facing workplace sexual harassment is to report to WorkSafe BC um, under uh, workers' compensation legislation. Uh, workplace uh, WorkSafe BC is responsible for um, workplace health and safety in, in BC, and it is well recognized that a safe workplace includes a workplace that is free from harassment. Um, so work, workplace sexual harassment is um, certainly a health and safety issue um, within the jurisdiction of WorkSafe BC. Um, if a person contacts WorkSafe, um, uh, WorkSafe may be able to send a prevention officer um, to their work site uh, to you know, ensure that um, employer has proper policies, uh, training and reporting mechanisms in place um, to prevent harassment. Um, they will typically not you know, investigate and you know, issue a opinion on whether something is or is not harassment, um, but rather they, their role is to ensure that the employer has the proper um, systems in place to deal with um, and respond to and prevent harassment. Um, but there are two situations in which um, uh, someone can potentially um, claim and access compensation um, for experiencing workplace sexual harassment um, under the Workers' Compensation Act. Um, so first, um, if uh, there's a, a complaint uh, called prohibited action, and so if a worker um, does make a report to WorkSafe, um, they raise a concern about sexual harassment in the workplace um, with their employer or um, uh, or they are you know, unhappy with the employer's response and they um, try to get WorkSafe involved. Um, if that worker ends up facing retaliation from their employer for that, um, for instance, they are terminated or demoted or, um, or transferred um, uh, against their um, wishes, the worker can bring a complaint of a prohibited action. Um, so this refers to uh, protection from retaliation for exercising uh, a right or a duty under the Workers' Compensation Act uh, relating to occupational health and safety. Um, so for instance, reporting a safety issue or refusing unsafe work. Um, 
the worker may be able to seek compensation um, for things like lost wages if they were terminated and out-of-pocket expenses resulting from the prohibited action. Um, and as well, WorkSafe um, uh, has uh, you know, broad remedial powers um, to order the employer to, for instance, remove reprimands um, or facilitate um, uh, a return to work. So, um, so that's one possibility. Um, basically, that, you know, proceeds um, sort of like a, um, you know, a hybrid between an investigation and an adjudication. Um, so it's a little bit different from the Human Rights Tribunal, which is much more adjudicative um, in nature. Um, WorkSafe will, you know, invest, do a bit of an investigation initially, at least, um, you know, interviewing both sides. Um, and then later, um, you know, the matter will often proceed um, to their um, legal uh, division, um, which will, you know, can assist with mediation um, and then eventually issue a decision. Um, and it's important to note that um, if the uh, if the prohibited action, such as the termination, um, was in, even in part motivated by um, uh you know, reasons relating to the worker exercising that right or duty um, uh, under under the act, then it's the action is tainted. So it's um, it's quite uh, a, a can, can potentially be quite a broad um, action. Um, another option as well for workers um, uh, who have experienced sexual harassment at work is that they may be able to make a claim uh, for compensation. Um, to WorkSafe BC um, for basically, um, you know, a workplace injury. Um, and so, for example, if they have a diagnosed mental um, disorder that was caused predominantly by a work-related stressor, which could include sexual harassment, um, then they may be able to make a claim for compensation. Um, this uh, kind of works the same way as making a claim for compensation based on a physical injury and being unable to um, return to work um, uh, for that reason. Now, um, because of the need um, for the person to have uh, a diagnosed a mental disorder um, that's recognized such as a uh, diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder um, and the need to establish a high degree of causation between the work-related stressor, such as harassment um, and their condition. This can often be a, a high bar to meet, um, but it may be possibility depending on your client's um, circumstances and can offer um, you know, a way for them to exit uh, a, a potentially an abusive situation and receive um, wage loss uh, uh, benefits um, while they are um, recovering. So there's a few, um, I've just, we've put here on the slide a few different um, phone numbers and uh, contact information because um, there's a few different ways that WorkSafe BC can become involved. Um, so we've put here the prevention information line, um, which is uh, a phone number that um, you know, clients can call to get information and advice from a prevention officer, and in some cases, request a site visit, um, which could be helpful depending on the circumstances, maybe. Um, we've also uh, put information up about how to um, uh, make a claim. Um, it's a different phone number uh, that they can call to initiate the claims process. Um, and as well, um, if they um, do wish to file a prohibited action complaint that can be done online um, at WorkSafe um, BC's website or uh, by mail or fax. So we have put those links up there. Um, another option as well um, is that uh, for, for workers whose employment has been terminated or they've um, been forced to quit um, due to workplace sexual harassment, um, they may be able to make a civil claim in court. So in this context, um, uh, the worker would be basically making a claim that they've been wrongfully terminated um, or constructively dismissed. Um, constructively dismissed um, refers to being forced to quit, um, basically due to um, intolerable uh, working conditions um, that could include workplace uh, facing, you know, prolonged workplace sexual harassment that wasn't couldn't wasn't effectively resolved. Um, 
the um, remedies that uh, a client can access through this um, type of uh, claim could be compensation um, based on the length of uh, service. Um, so in basically a notice period um, that would compensate them for the time that it will take them to find uh, alternate employment. Um, this is normally tied to you know, the length of time that they've worked for the employer, the longer they've worked, the longer the notice period, um, but other factors do play in as well. Um, and they may also be able to um, claim for aggravated damages, um, which are available when the employer's um, conduct um, leading to the termination was, you know, egregious, unfair, um, bad faith, um, et cetera. So that's, um, and those awards are non-pecuniary, uh, so they um, aren't, you know, they don't, they don't have to prove um, a specific type of, you know, like, like ascertainable loss, um, but they may be required to produce like medical evidence, for instance, of the impact on them uh, caused by the, um, the conduct and the termination. Um, we also wanted to note that um, uh, clients who are experiencing workplace sexual harassment may also have claims that can be made under employment standards legislation um, by uh, filing a complaint with the employment standards branch. So um, under the Employment Standards Act, um, there is a certain um, uh, legislated um, period of um, severance pay, essentially, that um, folks are entitled to. It's often much lower than what they would get if they went to court or what they could be entitled to if they went to court. Um, but there is um, some uh, basis to claim for uh, for for uh, compensation in lieu of um, notice um, if they've been fired or they had to quit um, due to the harassment. Um, and as well, um, you know, for folks who are um, going through um, harassment in the workplace, there may be other abuses or other violations of provincial employment law that they are experiencing. Um, for instance, uh, they may have um, not been, they may, their employer may not be paying them, you know, wages properly in accordance with the uh, legislation such as overtime. Um, and there may be other violations as well. So this is potentially also um, another option. Sometimes uh, workplace sexual harassment may be a criminal offense, and uh, we've listed a, a few offenses um, that it could uh, also be on the slide. Um, so sexual assault um, is uh, the intentional sexual touching of any kind without consent or attempts or threats of unwanted sexual touching. And uh, in the criminal contents, context must, consent must be affirmative or voluntary. Uh, criminal harassment is a behavior that a person knows or, or is rec reckless in that is harassing a person and causes them to reason reasonably fear for their safety. Um, we think, uh, Obviously, with a criminal complaint, you, you, you do call the police to make a report. And if you do have immediate concerns, you can also call the police. Um, it's important, um, I think, that the person may get other uh, supports in, which, in that regard, in terms of making a, a complaint to the police. Um, so we may recommend that they call a victim support um, if the person is in fear of their immediate safety, it is possible uh, to explore getting a peace bond uh, that might restrict um, the person, uh, the harasser, from um, uh, having interactions with them or coming close to their home. Um, if the complainant is uh, not comfortable uh, making a, a formal complaint and being identified, um, there is an option for a complainant to make what's called a third party report. And that's done through a community agency um, because it's important to recognize that in a, in a criminal process or a criminal complaint, the complainant does not have uh, control over that. The police will investigate and the prosecution decides uh, whether to proceed with a charge 
and the complainant becomes a witness. Um, so uh, Victim Link, uh, whose number is provided here, does provide support um, so that uh, people can be placed into contact with victim support uh, services that are uh, close uh, to them in their region. Um, and also, if they were considering doing a third party report, uh, community agencies who might assist with that. Um, and of course, uh, if someone uh, is a victim of a crime, they may be able to receive compensation through the Crime Victims Assistance Program. And that does also provide uh, compensation um, for uh, lost wages or uh, expenses such as counseling that are, are related um, and to assist them in recovering. Um, I think it, it's useful to note that uh, Sharp Workplaces does have some criminal lawyers on our roster. So where somebody might come to us uh, who's considering um, a report and has um, been sexually assaulted or uh, suffered, experienced more serious harassment that might be another criminal offense. Uh, that we can uh, provide them with um, a lawyer who has um, criminal expertise. So another option that we wanted to highlight um, in regards to income supports um, for um, for individuals who may be experiencing sexual harassment is employment insurance. Um, so this can provide a means for, um, for folks who are experiencing harassment at work to leave an abusive situation, um, either temporarily um, or permanently, and have some income support. Um, and in a moment, um, we're going to talk about some specific issues relating to um, uh, migrant workers and newcomers and how um, this intersects with authorization to work. Um, but something to note is that um, many, um, uh, there have been many changes uh, to the eligibility for EI um, over the past year. I won't review them in this context, but um, the eligibility has um, broadened significantly. So it is worth exploring whether your client is eligible for EI. Um, Normally, you would have to look at the number of insurable hours of um, work that they're doing um, and among other factors. Um, so with respect to um, uh, regular benefits, um, so these are benefits uh, that a person can access if there's been an interruption in earnings um, and uh, they have basically lost their employment um, uh, through, you know, usually um, not uh, their own choice, but as we know, um, many um, individuals who um, have experienced sexual harassment may have no choice but to quit um, or take a leave of absence. Um, and normally um, there is a disqualification if you have quit your employment, however, um, without just cause. Um, however, the legislation, um, uh, the Employment Insurance Act uh, does provide that just cause exists um, if the claimant had no reasonable alternative to leaving, having regard for all the circumstances, including sexual or other harassment, um, amongst other factors um, that are set out in the legislation. So experiencing um, sexual harassment, um, according to the um, EI uh, policy, would normally be considered just cause for leaving, um, although the adjudicator may consider whether the claimant had reasonable alternatives, such as um, uh, such as um, accessing an internal um, reporting mechanism, um, reporting the harassment to their um, employer, but that's not determinative of whether they can access benefits. Um, the EI uh, Digest for Benefits Entitlements, which is the policy, um, does uh, state that the fact that a person did not take any recourse or await the outcome of a remedy before volunteer voluntarily leaving employment um, should not you know, necessarily be held against the claimant if the situation indicates that intolerable harassment that could not have been resolved, you know, immediately um, was occurring. So um, 
basically, um, you know, I think it's just important to note that um, that that remedy uh, or that that option may be available. And um, as well, there's also the option of applying for sickness benefits. Um, this would normally require a medical note um, uh, certifying that the claimant is unable to return to work for medical reasons. And through this, they can get up to 15 weeks of benefits. So um, just, you know, um, might be um, good to consider whether any of these um, options may be available to your client. And we also wanted to note um, that specifically um, for the context of, um, of those of you who are working with newcomers and um, migrant workers, as a few of you mentioned um, that, uh, that you do, um, there are a number of kind of unique issues that come up when uh, supporting um, uh, individuals with precarious immigration status um, and newcomers. So newcomers to Canada may be vulnerable for sexual harassment in the workplace um, amongst you know, other forms of abuse for a variety of reasons, um, which include insecure immigration status um, and fears about you know, being able to remain in Canada, um, which creates a strong incentive to stay with the employer and stay in an abusive, potentially abusive situation. Um, other factors can include uh, lack of knowledge uh, regarding one's rights, um, lack of knowledge of resources and supports, language barriers, um, uh, cultural factors, etc. So um, in addition to the challenges that face newcomers generally, um, migrant workers um, who may be in Canada with temporary immigration status um, face a particular challenge because their immigration status, their ability to remain in Canada and to work and um, support themselves is often tied to a particular employer. And this can um, uh, be um, particularly um, an issue if the uh, person is, is facing abuse. Um, there's already a significant power imbalance um, in relation you know, between employers and employees and um, having temporary immigration status only exacerbates that. So, um, Basically, um, if a if a client um, is um, a migrant worker, a temporary foreign worker, um, and is facing workplace uh, sexual harassment, um, there are you know a number of considerations um, that we um, try to look at um, at um, when we assist clients and try to assist them to you know resolve situations with their immigration status um, so that they can then you know, go forward and feel secure in making a complaint against their employer if they wish to do so. Um, so we wanted to highlight some of these options. Um, in particular, um, there is um, a program uh, uh, currently um, uh, was introduced last year um, uh, called the Open Work Permit for Vulnerable Workers. So this may be an option for um, temporary foreign workers who are facing um, abuse in their employment. Um, sexual harassment um, is uh, a form of abuse for the purposes of um, this uh, particular um, uh, remedy. Um, so you know, we can assist um, workers to apply under this program, apply for an open work permit that would essentially allow them to work for any employer rather than only the employer that um, is listed on their work permit, um, the employer that's potentially harassing them. Um, there are also options um, to apply for a temporary resident permit, um, including for victims of trafficking in persons. Um, I won't uh, go into this in uh, detail, but this could be an option. And um, in many of the cases that we have seen um, uh, at at um, Migrant Workers Center, um, folks who may be experiencing sexual harassment maybe are often experiencing a variety of other forms of abuse as well, um, and may have you know lost their immigration status and may have been um, being forced to uh, work against the terms of their work permit um, by their employer. So that. Um, a, a, a temporary resident permit can help uh, address some of those issues temporarily. Um, as well, they may um, have options to remain in Canada permanently. And this is, um, you know, for many individuals um, that, that we work with, you know, they don't want to do anything that would jeopardize their prospects of remaining in Canada on a long-term basis. And they may feel tied to the employer for that reason. They may feel that, um, you know, well, if I don't complete, you know, 
the amount of work that I need to do. Um, my employer's not going to, you know, support me and I'm, I'm going to have to leave. And they may actually have other options. So we try to explore those. Um, one of those might be a humanitarian and compassionate application for permanent residents. Um, depending on the circumstances and where the individual comes from, they may have um, other options as well. So these are some of the things that we try to um, work with um, the individual to support them with so that, you know, immigration status um, is, is not a barrier to um, accessing justice. Um, we just wanted to make a quick note about limitation periods, um, which are um, the bane of all of our existences, but are important. Um, so we've just mentioned a few um, on the slide here um, uh, for some of the options that we've mentioned. It's just important to be aware that there could be, you know, there could be deadlines. Always, always, always double check um, and, you know, assess your client's deadline um, uh, so that you know when it is. Um, of course, many pieces of legislation do allow for decision makers to um, extend time for filing, but um, but we, we don't want to, um, we can't overemphasize the importance of knowing what the deadline or limitation period um, for making a claim is. And we've put some of the common ones uh, up, on, up on the slide here. Uh, so now we're going to talk a little bit about our programs, and I was going to show you a video, which I'm not going to show you now because of time. Um, so just uh, so you're you're aware, we've uh, for the Sharp Work Places program, we've developed a, a number of videos that give an explanation and an example of what workplace sexual harassment is, and. Uh, outline how you can access our services and they're available on our website if they might help uh, you in uh, to share with clients to explain uh, about our service and how to access it. So just to give an overview of uh, the Sharp Workplaces services, uh, we we offer up to five hours of free confidential legal advice uh, from a lawyer and uh, we do uh, permit the lawyers to ask for an extension of time, and those are common right now. Uh, we want uh, to be able to get the client uh, to a good place. So, for example, if they're negotiating a settlement to help negotiate that settlement, if they're filing um, a human rights complaint to make sure that's filed so that we can hopefully hand them over to the human rights uh, clinic. Um, so for sharp workplaces, anyone in BC uh, can uh, apply. Uh, there's no um, income requirement. Uh, we also uh, obviously want to treat the client as a whole person holistically. Uh, so we will look to provide referrals to address their other issues such as counseling or employment services. Um, so we're hoping to make a uh, uh, a broader referral network as well, uh, which we'll talk about later, hopefully, if we have time. And of our services are provided by either staff lawyers, myself or my colleague, Coral Lister. And uh, we have a roster of lawyers um, across the province who uh, are uh, happy to accept cases. Uh, because we're located in class, we will be able to refer uh, the client further on to the human rights clinic or uh, the community law program if that's appropriate depending on their um, situation. Uh, this slide just outlines um, the sharp workplaces intake process so I won't really go into it. Um, basically to say that uh, currently we try to uh, get back to the client as soon as possible. Um, currently intakes are taking place over the phone, obviously because of COVID. We do have the capacity to hold uh, intake uh, calls or have client meetings over Zoom or in person if, uh, if the client needs to be accommodated. Um, we try to match the client with uh, the appropriate lawyer and that may take into consideration uh, where they're located, um, 
what their issue is both about, as I mentioned, we are criminal lawyers um, and uh, other factors. And uh, we do have and will provide uh, interpretation services as well. Yeah, and likewise, um, our um, the Respect at Work uh, Legal Clinic, um, uh, which is um, our our program um, that we are operating, um, uh, is providing uh, summary legal advice to newcomers um, who have faced sexual harassment with a focus as well on um, sort of integrated and um, coordinated services. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, but just to say a few words about our eligibility criteria. Um, so uh, as mentioned earlier, we are um, this program is open to all newcomers um, in BC. Um, regardless of immigration status. Um, if they identify as a newcomer, um, they're eligible for our services um, through Respect at Work. Um, and they can, um, to book an appointment, um, folks can call us or um, contact us by email. Um, I've put our phone number um, contact information up on the slide there. Um, we, I'll note that we also are operating a hotline, um, which is, um, uh, operating on Tuesday and Thursday evenings, um, as well as uh, during the day from Tuesday to Saturday. Um, and um, by calling the hotline, um, folks can get information um, and book an appointment as well. Um, services are provided uh, by our legal advocate um, and, uh, and staff lawyer. And um, I should mention as well that likewise, uh, we are doing intakes um, over the phone um, and virtually um, at the moment due to COVID-19. Um, however, we can also, you know, accommodate, um, uh, you know, in other forms of, um, of meeting if um, the client needs and um, we do provide um, uh, services in various languages and interpretation if um, the language is not one that we can offer um, uh, internally. And um, yeah, so our focus um, at, you know, at the Respect at Work Legal Clinic is on providing coordinated services um, within, you know, our clinical model um, to newcomers to support them to be able to access um, justice um, meaningfully. And a key part of that is often supporting with matters um, that are connected to their immigration status. So to that effect, um, Respect at Work, um, uh, you know, coordinates, um, works together with our core legal advocacy program at MWC um, to provide full representation to migrant workers um, who have faced uh, sexual harassment. Um, so through our core program, we can offer full representation um, to workers in matters such as um, uh, employment standards, um, Im various immigration matters, uh, such as permanent residency applications, work permit applications, um, temporary resident permit applications, and other types of cases on a case-by-case -case basis. So these services are um, provided, like I said, through our core legal advocacy program, but we, you know, work very, very closely um, to coordinate um, those services. So if a client is accessing services through Respect at Work, um, you know, they will automatically be considered um, their eligibility for, um, for, for core um, legal advocacy services. And if a client does not qualify for services through our legal advocacy program, for example, if they are a Canadian permanent resident um, or a citizen and not a um, someone we would consider to be a migrant worker, and then we will facilitate referrals um, to agencies that can provide um, representation. And so to that effect, um, uh, towards the end of the presentation, we're hoping to um, yeah, discuss opportunities to collaborate um, with all of you and connect and, and build referral networks. Um, so yeah, and I should say that our services are provided in-house by staff um, uh, staff at the Migrant Worker Center. So just a little bit about um, briefly how our programs can help, and this is common to both um, SHARP workplaces and Respect at Work. Um, we can advise on whether the conduct is sexual harassment, um, so we can talk to uh, the client about, you know, what they're experiencing and 
potentially help, um, you know, uh, framing or identifying that um, as sexual harassment. Um, we can provide advice on legal options and possible remedies. Um, we can support clients with addressing sexual harassment in, in the workplace um, if the client does want to address it. Um, we can um, assist with reviewing documents or drafting documents, including, for instance, um, complaint, like a human rights complaint or a prohibited action complaint, um, so that um, that could be provided in the context of our um, summary legal uh, services. And as well, um, uh, our programs can offer coaching um, to guide their clients through complaint or legal process. And um, we also, as mentioned, um, do our best to facilitate referrals to additional supports, um, such as counseling or employment services as well. So if you do um, have a client that you want to refer to us, um, it is always really helpful um, to have some information up front if that's possible. Um, some of the information that um, it, it's really great if clients can have when they do um, call to book an appointment are you know, a timeline, um, rough timeline of events, um, including dates um, that things happen so that we can you know, identify any looming um, deadlines or limitation periods, um, as well names of people who are involved. Um, this is necessary so that we can run conflict checks. Um, we also, um, you know, do um, encourage if folks have it to provide any relevant documents such as uh, termination letters, contracts, um, or if they're already involved in a, you know, legal process, um, like a complaint before the Human Rights Tribunal, any um, correspondence. Um, from the tribunal in relation to that. Um, and if they are aware of any upcoming deadlines in their legal matter, it's great to know those in advance. So uh, that's really the end of our presentation. Um, we have uh, uh, some case studies now and um, uh, we, before we go to the case studies, perhaps if anybody has any questions, uh, you can raise them now. Uh, otherwise, we will be breaking you up into groups um, to discuss the case studies. I see there is a question in the chat, a poster summary sheet of what the program does. Um, uh, yes, well, we do. We have a brochure actually available on our website, which we can also upload onto the schedule site after. Um, Juliana, do you have an information sheet for your program? Yes, we do as well. Um, we have a poster and um, information sheets um, in that we can um, distribute to you. So um, it would be great um, if you can uh, email us. Um, I'll put my email address in the chat there um, and we can coordinate getting those resources um, to you. So thanks, great, great question. There's another question in the chat about um... Does the criminal lawyer accompany the client to file a complaint with the police? Uh, so with our program, uh, the lawyers do provide advice uh, to the uh, client and they're not um, representing them. Um, and that's a restriction of the funding. Um, it's the same for Juliana's uh, program as well. Um, some lawyers may do more than other lawyers in terms of uh, that issue, but it, it's often um, actually not in the best interest for the lawyer representing uh, or giving advice to complain it to, um, well, I don't know, the uh, filing with the police is, is uh, actually all right. So I take that back. I was thinking in terms of becoming a witness in a situation. Um, so it, I, I can't say that they do. Uh, some lawyers do go out, out of their way to do more, but it does uh, depend on the lawyer. We do recommend that people um, contact uh, victim support services. So we do, for example, have a couple cases now where the lawyer is meeting with the client and the victim support worker in terms of uh, providing them supports um, to go forward. Uh, under legal aid, 
if uh, if a case is taken and there is a criminal trial, there is a possibility that you could get a legal aid lawyer. Uh, the complainant could get a legal aid lawyer when they're at trial. I think Lisa uh, is on uh, in the group. Um, from Legal Aid, and she's actually responsible for doing that. I don't know if Lisa wants to say more, but the issue is that before that stage, there isn't um, another way to get assistance for a complainant. Does anyone else have uh, questions? Yeah, Lisa, do you want to add more to that or expand on what supports are available? Sorry, um, I was just going to say um, I, I am involved in finding complainants um, counsel for um, sexual assault trials. Um, that's done specifically in relation to different kinds of applications that, that the defense lawyer might be making in the case, either for their records or for um, to bring in some prior hist sexual history that they might have. So they're in quite specific limited circumstances where um, Crown Counsel will contact us and ask us to find a lawyer and um, and then we appoint lawyers for those applications. Um, so that, that's what we do. So it wouldn't be at the stage of going in to make a complaint, which I think was maybe the original question. Yes. Thank you, yeah. Lisa, for, Thank for you. clarifying that. Find that. Um, we, just so people also know, Eva BC had had a pilot project funded to provide representation to complainants um, at an earlier stage who were experiencing sexual assault. And that was also funded by the Department of Justice. Uh, I think that program is um, in evaluation now. Uh, they had funded a number across the, the country. So we're hoping uh, that they continue to uh, fund that, um, that support. But it is certainly uh, limited at the moment. So if uh, people have had time to download the case study questions uh, or the case studies. There are four case studies and we're going to break you up, I think, into um, four groups uh, to discuss. Or, uh, and we have three questions we'd like you to discuss.